Welcome to Across Africa, our weekly look at stories from across the continent. Uh, tonight, we look at pro-military protesters in Sudan who want the civilian government gone and military leaders to take over. Critics of the rallies say that they're far from organic and have been orchestrated by security forces and backers of the former regime. Also, Ethiopian state media confirms the military's launched airstrikes on the capital of the northern region of Tigray after almost a year of deadly conflict. And will he or won't he? The specifics of the ambitions of former Ivorian President Laurent Bagbo remain up in the air as he says that he'll be part of politics until he dies and launches a new political party. But first up, police in Sudan fired tear gas at pro-army protesters in Khartoum on the third day of a sit-in. They're calling on the military to dissolve the civilian government with which it has shared interim power following the 2019 uprising against former leader Omar Bashir. Some suspect the unrest is backed by military forces and sympathisers of the former regime. The transitional government, run by Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok, is, along with the Sovereign Council, due to steer the country towards elections set for 2023. However, political divisions run deep. Last month, the government said it foiled an attempted coup that it blamed on military officers. Asma Ismail tells us more. I think the current uh, crisis has been really unfolding for a number of weeks, as you rightly mentioned. Uh, this have really very much started since the uh, information about the foiled coup on 21st of September. And since then, a number of political uh, developments have been taking place more significantly. Uh, the statement from Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and Hemeti from the Sovereign Council, the head of the Sudan army and the uh, rapid support forces have been uh, publicly criticizing their civilian counterparts and uh, addressing a number of issues from security sector reform uh, and threatening with an early elections. Uh, the skepticism from the current uh, sit-in in front of the palace uh, really stems in from uh, those who are organizing uh, this, uh, although a uh, number of them uh, are part of the government, uh, ironically headed by uh, the Minister of Finance, who on the 16th was taking part of the rally in front of the palace, calling for the chairperson of the Sovereign Council to dissolve the government, and the following day he went to office and continued his duty. Uh, another leader within that is re the governor of that four region. Uh, and, uh, they are part and signatories to the Juba Peace Agreement, yet they are calling for a major uh, constitutional, uh, they're calling for act that is against the constitutional document, which is calling for the head of the uh, sovereign council to dissolve the government, yet that is clearly not his right and not his mandate. Um, and again, this is really, while it's looking like the uh, those who are organizing the sit-in are rightly calling for widening the participation and the, the social base uh, of the representation of the government, uh, but they are using that as an umbrella to bring in members of the deposed regime who are part of the new political alliance that was announced 10 days after the information about the foil coup, and it's largely believed to be supported by the military for a number of reasons. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll just highlight that. Uh, no protest movement have been able to protest in front of the, the palace uh, for a number of years. Uh, the Sovereign Council has been very much, and prior to that, the Milit Transition and Military Council have been very protective of this area. Uh, yet this group was uh, able to do that, which is really a clear uh, signal uh, to a, a support from the military side uh, to their protest. And, um, and just... As my, sorry, you, you've really outlined just how incoherent in some ways the the some of the the kind of high level backing of these protests uh, it, it appears to be um very quickly what's your take on how uh, much all of this is a threat to sudan's political transition i think this is the seri the most serious threat to uh, the partnership between the civilians and the military uh, since the transition started and uh, it's really a culmination or a manifestation of deeper issues that uh, are 
uh, that are on the agenda uh, for, for the partners. Um, really, one of them, one key issue is the, the, the big question about the security sector reform, uh, and that have been uh, highlighted by both uh, Hemeti and Burhan in their statements after the foiled coup. Uh, th that is a, s a significant issue that is uh, attracting a lot of attention from the civic actors that security should be uh, and military institutions should be reformed. Esme Ishmael there for us. Now, at least three people have been killed after the Ethiopian Air Force reportedly launched airstrikes against the city of Mikili. It's the capital of the embattled northern region of Tigray, which has been at war with federal forces and their allies since last year. Maria Gerth Nicolescu has more. The Ethiopian government had first denied having carried out airstrikes targeting Tigray's capital city on Monday, but the Ethiopian press agency, which is run by the state, confirmed that the attack was conducted by the Ethiopian Air Force. It said the airstrikes targeted communications infrastructure in the city of Mekele, sources on the ground, including aid workers, said the strikes hit the outskirts of the city, as well as two locations within the regional capital, targeting an area near a major hotel often used by officials of the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front. But with communication lines still shut down in Tigray, this type of information is still very difficult to verify. A leader of the TPLF group said he believed the government was targeting civilian populations, Monday being a market day uh, in Mekele. Maria there for us in Ethiopia. Now, dozens of people have been killed in a raid by an armed gang in Sokoto State in northwestern Nigeria. Known locally as bandits, they targeted the village of Goronia late on Sunday. Samuel Lakoya with more. The Sokoto State government said 30 persons were killed as a result of this attack. But residents said more than 60 corpses were taken to the Goronyo General Hospital. Those who escaped the attack said the gunmen fired indiscriminately into the crowded market. This latest attack is believed to be a reprisal for the killing of some bandits by vigilantes. The bandits are known to carry out brutal reprisals when vigilantes or villagers kill their members. This is the third time in two weeks that gunmen have carried out this type of attack in Sokoto State. Early this month, 20 persons were killed when gunmen attacked a market in Sabongeri village, also in Sokoto State. Weeks back, the Nigerian military commenced a major military operation against bandits in Sokoto State and other parts of northwest Nigeria. But the bandits have continued their attacks in spite of the military onslaught. It seems the Nigerian military will have to do more to protect lives and properties in Sokoto State and in other parts of northwest Nigeria. The husband of a murdered Kenyan athlete appeared in court on Monday before being remanded in custody for 20 days. Ibrahim Rotich is the chief suspect in the killing of Agnes Tirob. The 25-year-old 10K record breaker and double world championship medalist was a rising star. She was found fatally stabbed at her home in Iten last week. Her death has shocked the nation and the athletics world. Former Ivorian President Laurent Gbagbo has launched a new political party and vowed to participate in politics until the end of his life. He only returned to the country in June after almost a decade away fighting war crimes charges at the International Criminal Court. His new party's fueled speculation about whether he'll run for the top job again, but he is remaining cagey. Our correspondents tell us more. The president of the newly founded African People's Party takes to the stage as a 1,600-strong audience cheers him on. Laurent Gbagbo officially took up the reins of this left-wing pan-African political formation after members of the party's constitutive congress unanimously elected him on Saturday. This role consolidated his return to the political scene after a 10-year absence. In the hour-long speech he gave on Sunday, the former head of state was keen to put an end to speculation about his future plans. Mon ambition. My ambition today is to retire. The structure of the party that we founded is made to prepare my withdrawal. But I do not leave it to anyone to decide when I should call it. If Laurent Gbagbo assured that the party would lay the ground for his succession, his supporters gathered at a Congress village nearby were not ready to give up on their leader. Sa vision. 
His vision is one that will help the Ivorian people and Africa to understand what direction to follow, to find happiness and freedom. He has to come and help us so our children can move forward and our businesses too. He has the key to Ivory Coast. He just has to open it so we can all come home. The African People's Party Constitutive Congress was marked by another unexpected speech. The executive director of the ruling RHDP party, who came to represent President Alassane Ouattara, played the diplomatic card. I'd like to tell all of you gathered here that the RHDP will nurture a relationship with President Laurent Gbagbo's new party. It's a step forward in the process of national reconciliation, but for Long Begbo, as he reiterated on Sunday, reconciliation will not be complete until political exiles can return home and prisoners are released. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us and do so again if you can. Till then, take care.